Well, there are some things in the Bible that nobody really understands. So if you don't understand it, don't feel bad. We'll take a look here at Exodus. God said to Moses, when you get back to Egypt, be prepared. All the wonders that I will do through you, you'll do before Pharaoh. But I will make him stubborn so that he will refuse to let the people go. Now, first of all, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, the leader of Egypt. This is not God simply saying, I, God, will make Pharaoh stubborn so that this whole thing plays out and all of the Egyptians suffer. I think we have to understand that hardening of heart, which is what happens to Pharaoh, the hardening of his heart. Pharaoh is the one initially responsible for this, and God lets it play out. When God says, I will make him stubborn or I will harden his heart, he doesn't mean I'm doing that just to show you I'm God. He means this is what happens to people who dig in their heels against me. I allow them to become or I make them stubborn and hardened of heart. I allow to play out the consequences of their behavior. In the same way, it can be said that God doesn't send people to hell. He allows people to choose hell. Let's look again because things get even stranger. Then you are to tell Pharaoh, verse 22, God's message, Israel is my son, my firstborn. I told you, free my son so that he can serve me, but you refuse to let him free, to free him. So now I'm going to kill your son, your firstborn. A lot of this stuff is deeply strange because I think it hits upon ancient rituals and an ancient way of thinking about how religion works and how God works. Um, but look at what we can at least can see from, from, at least from looking at it from the point of view of literature. If you were stu to study this as I would do a work of literature, you would say, God is making a comparison between Israel as his firstborn son, his chosen people. Remember, as I've been saying in my classes recently, my other classes, because I try to give my students an overview of salvation history because they probably don't know it. Up until Abraham, who lived about 2,000 years before Christ, there was nothing but pagans. Mankind seeked, seeked, sought God. <laughs> How embarrassing. I'm glad that this isn't going on the internet. Mankind sought God, but didn't know the true God. There were multiple gods. There was sacrifice. There was human sacrifice. There was a search for God and much confusion in our search for God. God begins to reveal himself to his chosen people by first speaking to Abraham 400, 500 years before this story, more than that. And this is, this is more like probably 600 years before this story, when God appears to Abraham. And God begins to form a people that he will eventually reveal himself to fully. These are the people we call the Jews, the Hebrews, or the nation of Israel. Now we're in the part of their story where they're being held in Egypt as slaves. We know how they got there. They got here through the great providence of God, through Joseph, but now they're suffering and God is listening to their affliction. They will eventually wander through the wilderness toward the promised land, but the Jews will struggle to be true to the one true God who reveals to them through Moses his moral law. Eventually, God brings Jesus Christ, born from the Jews, the Messiah to the Jews, as a new Moses to lead them from the slavery of sin to the true promised land, the kingdom of God. That's the overview. So that Israel is his firstborn son, his first chosen people. Now, eventually, the Jews reject the Messiah and crucify him. And the parables of Jesus suggest that God will then turn to his second-born son, so to speak, the Gentiles. 
Paul goes through this over and over again in his missionary journeys. He will go to the synagogue first. He will preach Jesus. They will reject him. Sometimes they will stone him, whip him, beat him up. He will then turn to the Gentiles. So in a way, we're seeing played out the trope or the theme of the younger son inheriting the blessing of the firstborn, which is not what you would expect, especially in the ancient world. But here, Joseph is saying to Moses, tell Pharaoh, this is my firstborn son. You'd better let him go. God knows that Pharaoh won't. And so God says, tell Pharaoh, if you don't let my firstborn son go, your firstborn son will die, which is the last plague to be visited upon Egypt. Spoiler alerts, of course, but we will get there and this paves the way for it. Now then something even weirder happens. I mean, that all kind of makes a certain amount of sense. It's weird. We don't know why God is working this way. <clears throat> and I have to like go bend over backwards to kind of say, God's not just saying, hey, I'm God. Look at how miserable I'm going to make the Egyptians. This plays itself out in mysterious ways that you have to be sensitive to. Because if you read it on the surface, it really does look as if God is being unjust. But then this next passage, what the heck are we to make of this? Okay, so I had it um, highlighted. <laughs> the highlight went away. It's because how the heck am I going to talk about it? On the journey back, as they camped for at night, God met Moses and would have killed him. But Zipporah took a flint knife and cut off her son's foreskin and touch Moses' member with it. Now, in some translations, it says his foot. That's a euphemism. I won't go into any more detail because my students are homeschooled high school students. She said, oh, you're a bridegroom of blood to me, a bloody bridegroom to me. Then God let him go. She used the phrase bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. And then Aaron meets Moses, Moses goes to Egypt, they begin to talk to the Hebrews, and the Israelites are glad that Moses is there and will begin to deliver them, especially through this signs, the signs and the staff and so forth. Okay, so what the heck is this all about? All I can tell you is people have been pondering and arguing about this passage in Exodus, well, for 2,000 years or more. I mean, I'm sure that the Jews pondered it, long before Christ came along. This happens, you know, in the 13th century BC, perhaps. So for over 3,000 years, people have wondered, what the heck does this passage mean? Well, all we can say is there's a connection between the circumcision of Zipporah's son and God wanting Moses to die. The connection between the cutting off of the foreskin of the sun and touching it to Moses' member, in other words, Moses receives a kind of reminder of his own circumcision and a kind of reminder that circumcision is a way of God saying, I have the right to the sacrifice of all male children, at least, who are born. And by circumcising them, you are acknowledging that all life and death come from me. So don't get full of yourself, Moses, because I could take you the way I will end up taking the firstborn of Egypt. And circumcision is a reminder of that, as baptism is a reminder that we participate in the death of Christ. And through that death, we participate in his resurrection. I think that's as much as we can say about it. What bloody bridegroom or bridegroom of blood means, lots of different people have been arguing about this, and I'm not going to venture into that, especially in a high school level course. But at any rate, it's weird, and I'll admit to it. But we are dealing with a level of religion and a level of encounter with God that is as bizarre as... God asking Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. We're at the sort of the beginning of what we would consider civilized religion. 
and there are still elements of a more atavistic, atavistic, atavistic is how I say it, faith. In other words, something that's prehistoric and that we don't fully understand. That's woven into this story, I think. One other quick thing I want to show you in Proverbs, and then I'm going to say goodbye, and I'm going to say, if you don't get it, I don't blame you. Anyone who rebukes a mocker will get an insult in return. Anyone who corrects the wicked will get hurt. So don't bother correcting mockers. They will only hate you. But correct the wise and they will love you. Instruct the wise and they will be even wiser. Teach the righteous and they will learn even more. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. This is a reminder to us not to mock at these stories when we don't understand them, but to try in humility to try to figure them out. And then we are told that wisdom is like, well, we have been told that wisdom is like a woman who calls to all men. Earlier, we had the little, um, the stories of a man committing adultery and being enticed by an adulterous wife. Those were set up as parallels. And now, even more so, a woman named Folly is brash. She is ignorant and doesn't know it. She says to people, she says to men, stolen water is refreshing. Food eaten in secret tastes the best, but little do they know that the dead are there. Her guests are in the depths of the grave. That's folly or foolishness or mockery personified as a woman calling out to men to come in and be with her in secret because she is just either a prostitute or an adulteress. And yet that is the way of death. Whereas wisdom calls to men and she calls them to life. So. We will try to be wise. All I can tell you is there is nothing, I don't think, in all of the Bible that is as strange as what we just read in Exodus. So bear with me and see if the story makes sense as we approach the sacrifice of the firstborn of Egypt and Passover, which saves the Jews from that. And of course, Passover eventually becomes the Eucharist.